Bongiorno again. I'm going to start on a somber note this morning. I hope it'll end up being a liberating reflection. We've had two events in the last three years, which I believe signal the end game for the Industrial Revolution based on fossil fuels. The first event, July 2008, do you remember that month? The price of crude oil hit $147 a barrel on world markets. And all the prices across the supply chain went through the roof. Because everything in this global economy is made out of fossil fuels. We grow our food in petrochemical fertilizers and pesticides. All of our construction materials are fossil fuel based, plastic to cement. Most of our pharmaceutical products are still made out of petrochemicals. Our synthetic fiber, our power, our transport heat and light, it's all made from the carbon deposits of a previous period in history. So in 2007, when oil started going over $80 a barrel, that's the key, all the other prices went up. At $120 a barrel, we had food riots in 22 countries because 40% of the human race this morning lives on $2 a day or less. So when the price of wheat, barley, rye, and rice started doubling and tripling because of the oil price, we had a billion people in harm's way. And the UN put out an alert, the, the FAO, saying we've got a real problem. We could have a billion people on the verge of starvation. At 147 a barrel, the prices for everything on the supply chain were so high, everyone stopped buying. And the entire engine shut down of the Industrial Revolution. What I want to suggest to all of you here in the ICT and business community is that was the economic earthquake. The collapse of the financial market 60 days later was the aftershock. Why is this happening? This is an end game. What I'm suggesting is in the business community, we now know the outer limits of how far we can globalize this world based on the second industrial revolution. It's 150 a barrel, and it'll shut down every time. And the reason is we've hit two milestones now in economic history. Peak oil per capita and now global peak oil production. Peak oil per capita occurred in 1979 at the height of the auto age. Here we are in fiat territory, height of the auto age. Had we distributed all the crude oil that we had in 1979 to everyone alive at that moment on the planet and shared it, that's the most each person could have. We found more oil in the last 30 years, but population rose quicker. So if we distributed all the crude oil we have this morning to 7 billion people, there's just less to go around. And then we've now hit global peak oil production. Now that's a geological term. That's when half the crude oil is used up on the Hubert Bell curve in geology. When half the crude oil is used up, it's over because you can't afford the price after that. Now this idea of global peak oil has been controversial for 20 years among geologists. But last December, the International Energy Agency, which we rely on in the energy industry for our data, they dropped a bombshell for the business community. And in their 2011 energy report, they said, it looks like we peaked in 2006 at 70 million barrels of crude oil a day. We'll likely plateau down at 69 million barrels a day, but listen to this. The IEA, International Energy Agency, says it's going to cost us $7 trillion to get the remaining oil out in the next two decades. So when India and China made a robust bid to bring one-third of the human race into the game at an 8, 10, and 12 percent growth rate in the last 10 years, the aggregate demand against crude oil was just too great, and at 147, the engine shut down. Every time we try to regrow this global economy, at the same rate we were growing before July 2008, oil prices go up, all the other prices for everything else goes up, purchasing power shuts down. It's an end game. Proof is in the pudding. 
2009, oil went down to 30 a barrel because there was no economic activity. In 2010, we started replenishing inventories. Oil went up. It's 115 a barrel this morning. Purchasing power shutting down all over the world. And we're heading to a second collapse. We're going to see cycles of four years. Shut down, start the engine, replenish inventory, shut down. We have other fuels. Tar sands, heavy oil, coal, shale gas, they're more expensive, and it gets us to the second big issue, climate change. December 2009, heads of state from 192 countries come together in Copenhagen to address the entropy bill for the industrial age. How many engineers do we have here? Thank God. I'm more comfortable with you because you know more about economics than the economist because at least you studied the laws of thermodynamics, <laughs> which be, governs all economic activity. You'd probably be surprised that your economist colleagues have no clue about the laws of thermodynamics, so they have no way to model economic activity. So you know that you cannot escape the second law of thermodynamics. We're paying the entropy bill here. For two centuries of spewing carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, to maintain an industrial carbon-based life. How bad is climate change? It's now reached the point that I have to use the word terrifying. That's the only word I can use at this point. Our scientists issued their fourth assessment report in the UN climate panel in 2007. 2,500 scientists, 125 countries, every National Academy of Science, 20 years of modeling, biggest scientific project in history, and the results aren't good. What our scientists are telling us, and this was in 2007, that we may see a three degrees Celsius rise in temperature on Earth in this century of your children and grandchildren. Now that's looking optimistic five years later. It's going to go, we think, higher. But to put this in perspective, if we go up to three degrees, in this century of your kids, that takes us back to the temperature on Earth three million years ago in the Pliocene. Completely different ecosystems. And what I need to urge you to understand is it's all about water. Climate change is all about the radical shift in the hydrological cycle. We are the watery planet. Everything's made out of water. Our bodies, our physiology, the Earth. Now, for every one degree that the temperature rises on Earth from industrial-induced CO2, methane, and nitrous oxide, the atmosphere absorbs 7% more precipitation from the ground. It just sucks it up. Every one degree, 7% more precipitation collected in the atmosphere. That means more floods, more droughts, more wildfires, more tsunamis, more more a glacier melt, more hurricanes, and that's what's happening. Ecosystems cannot adjust in a short moment to the complete shift of the hydrological cycle of the Earth. And that's why our scientists say we are now on the cusp of the sixth mass extinction event in the last 500 million years, right now, this morning. We've had five wipeouts in the last 500 million years, and they come quick. When the chemistry shifts in the planet, species die. And every time we had a mass extinction of life, it took 10 million years, 10 million years to recover the, all the biodiversity that was lost. So now we're in the sixth extinction event, the early stages, and our scientists in the UN panel say the models show we could lose on the upward end 70% of all the life forms on this Earth in this century, your century, everyone here under 40. Because my wife says we're, we're sleepwalking here. We're walking dead. What do we do? We've clearly hit peak globalization, 147 a barrel. Fossil fuels and uranium are sunset energies. The prices are going through the roof. It's volatile. It doesn't help the business community. The technologies based on these energies, like the internal combustion engine, are exhausted. There's no S-curve. And the infrastructure of this civilization is based on carbon deposits, and the prices are going through the roof. And now we're paying the climate bill 
for the entropy. And it's impacting agriculture and infrastructure. And what do we do? We need a new economic vision that's compelling. We need a new economic game plan for that vision that's deliverable. This vision and game plan has to move as quickly in the developing countries as the developed countries. We have to be off carbon by 2040. So we need to step back and ask this question. How do the great economic revolutions in history occur? Because if we know how they occur, we can get a little road map here on where the business community needs to go. The great economic revolutions in history occur when two things come together. First, we change the way we organize energy. We've had a lot of different energy regimes. New energy regimes make possible more complex civilizations. We increase the energy flow. It allows us to bring more people together, differentiate skills, and integrate them into more complex economic and social units. We annihilate time and space with energy. When we create new energy regimes, and they make possible more complex economic, social, and political arrangements, they require something else, a new communication revolution to manage them. When energy revolutions converge with communication revolutions, they change the economic paradigm, they change consciousness, they change history. I'll give you an example. 19th century, print technology became cheap. After centuries of manual printing, we introduced steam power into printing, linotype and rotary presses. So we reduced the transaction cost and increased the volume, if you will, of printing. Then we introduced public schools in Europe and America. We created a print literate workforce with the communication skills to manage the complexities of a first industrial revolution based on coal and steam power. An illiterate workforce without print communication technology could not have done the job. In the 20th century, we had a second convergence of energy and communication. Centralized electricity, the telephone, then later radio and television became the communication media to manage the complexities of a dispersed auto, oil, suburban culture in a mass consumer society. That Second Industrial Revolution is now dying this morning. It is on life support. Let me share an anecdote. When Chancellor Merkel became Chancellor of Germany, she asked me to come the first few weeks of her government to help her government address the question, how do we grow the German economy in the 21st century and create jobs? Now, remember, Germany is the most robust industrial economy in the world. And with 80 million people, it still vies with China as the number one exporting power. It is a powerhouse. When I got to Berlin, I said to the Chancellor, my first question was, Madam Chancellor, how do you, regrow, how do you grow the German economy or the European economy or the world economy in the last stages of an energy era? With old technologies, old infrastructure, how do you do it? You can't do it. That's what's going on today. We could not maintain the fiction of a debt-ridden, credit-ridden credit -ridden global economy when the real economy finally went south in July 2008. That's what's happening here. We could keep the credit going and the debt going as long as the real economy was moving. But when we hit 147, the game was over. So all the financial reforms in the world would be great, but they won't help us unless we get to a new economic regime. So here's where we are this morning. We are on the cusp of a new convergence of communication and energy, a third industrial revolution that could get us post-carbon and to biosphere consciousness by mid-century. And some of the critical players are all in this room this morning. We had a very powerful communication revolution in the last 25 years, ICT and the Internet. And what's interesting about ICT and the Internet is it models communication completely differently than the Second Industrial Revolution. In the 20th century, I grew up with centralized electricity communication and telecommunication. 
top down. The ICT revolution and the internet is distinguished because the communication is distributed and collaborative. And it doesn't scale top down, it's lateral power, side by side. So today, and this is really amazing, I've got my little Blackberry. This is amazing, this only took 20 years and now 2.3 billion human beings with a little desktop computer, some good ICT, a little bit of a Blackberry or cell phone, 2.3 billion people now can send their own video, audio, and text to all the other people at the same time, speed of light, lateral power, distributed collaborative, with far more power than the centralized television network in the 20th century. We did this in 20 years. This distributed collaborative communication revolution, ICT Internet, in the last 24 months in Germany, and now in some other scattered regions of the world, and starting in Italy, is just now beginning to merge with a new energy regime, distributed energy, which by nature is collaborative and lateral. When internet communication merges and becomes the communication media to organize distributed energies, we have a powerful third industrial revolution. And we reboot the jobs, the businesses and the whole infrastructure of the world. What are distributed energies? Well, let me compare them to the energies we know, elite energies, coal, oil, gas, shale gas, tar sands, heavy oil, uranium. They're elite because when you go home today, I bet you you don't have them in your backyard. They're only found in a few places. They require huge military investments to get them huge geopolitical investments to manage them and massive capital to organize them vertically top down bringing fossil fuels and uranium and nuclear power to us through all the conversion processes is the most elite centralized top down energy structure in all of history what are distributed energies those are energies that are distributed and they're found in every square inch of this biosphere the sun shines all over this planet every single day the wind blows across the earth all, all day long. Wherever we tread, there's a hot geothermal core of energy underneath this planet, under the ground. In the rural areas, we have agricultural and forestry waste that can be converted at a moment's notice back to energy. Where we have ocean tides and waves coming into our urban coastal areas, that's a form of energy. Whenever we have garbage, we can bioconvert it right back to energy. We have enough distributed, green, renewable energy to provide for our species until kingdom comes. 45 minutes of sunlight can power the world for a year. The European Union has committed itself to a five-pillar infrastructure to bring ICT and the Internet together with distributed energies and create a new paradigm for the 21st century, a third industrial revolution. I was privileged to develop this plan with the European Parliament and the Commission. This is the formal plan of the EU. And I should say, this five pillar I'm going to lay out, Germany is doing this today. I was with the Chancellor on September 20th. We laid this out for Germany. Bosch, Siemler, Siemens, Daimler, small businesses, they're laying out this whole structure right now. Pillar one, the EU is committed to 20% renewable energy by 2020, which is a third of the electricity of Europe. That's a mandate, not a suggestion. Every region, including Piedmont, has got to do it. Pillar two. I want you to start thinking ICT for the rest of this. Pillar two, how do we collect distributed energies that are renewable? Now, our first thought was, well, that's good. We understand. The Spanish, the Greeks, and Italians have a lot of sun. Let's go down there, big, build some big solar parks, put in a high voltage line, and ship it to everyone else. The Irish have the wind, the Norwegians have the hydro. Concentrated parks, ship it in voltage lines. Now, none of us oppose these more concentrated uses of what are essentially distributed energies. The sun, the wind, geothermal parks, the hydro parks. They're essential. They're not sufficient. They're transitional. They're only a small part of the third industrial revolution. And there is no way to run the continental economy or a world economy trying to centralize what are essentially distributed energies. You couldn't do it. 
their only niche. You could not run a global economy with top-down centralized renewables. So pillar two, we began to ask a question in Europe that now seems so embarrassingly simple it's hard to even say it, but we started to ask, well, wait a minute, if renewable energies are distributed and they're found in every square inch of the world, why would we only collect them in a few central points? That's 20th century thinking based on elite energies that scale vertically. This got us to pillar two, buildings. Buildings use most of our energy and they're the number one cause of climate change. By the way, does anyone know what the number two cause of industrial climate change is? Beef production and consumption and animal husbandry, and I mention this because not a single world leader in 192 countries has made a single statement ever on the number two cause of climate change. Even Al Gore won't talk about it. Number three is transport. Number one, buildings. We have 191 million buildings in the European Union. Homes, offices, factories, rural, urban buildings. The mission, the goal, is to convert every single existing building in Europe to your own green power plant. You can get solar off the roof, vertical wind off the side of the building, geothermal heat under the ground, your garbage reconverted back to energy that works. The new buildings that have just come up, they're positive power. Buig Construction, Olivia Buig showed me the blueprints three years ago, I didn't think he'd do it. He's got a building up in the Paris suburbs two months ago near the OECD headquarters. This office complex sucks up just enough sun alone that it produces all of its own energy and sends back to the grid. General Motors has a factory that, they, uh, that makes opals in Aragon, Spain. It's a huge factory. They put solar photovoltaics on the roof. It only took them 60 days, 75 million bucks, nothing. Payback seven years. It's producing enough electricity right now, enough electricity for 5,000 homes. So pillar two, we convert the building stock of Europe to your own power plant. That jump starts construction. That's millions and millions and millions of jobs, day one. Every region that starts converting, day one you create the jobs. And the SMEs have to do the work. Think this way, 1970 mainframe computers owned by a few companies. Steve Jobs comes along and he gives everyone a desktop computer. And then a whole generation of ICT people come along, IBM and HP and Cisco and everyone else, and we create the internet. Now two billion people create their own information, share it laterally with each other. Now think today, centralized power and utility companies with fossil fuel energy, but within 20 years, these technologies are gonna get so cheap solar, wind, geothermal, they're following the exact cost curve of desktop computers and cell phones. The exact curve, Moore's Law setting in on solar, wind is competitive. Within 20 years, they're going to be so cheap, everyone's going to have them. They'll give them away and you buy the service. And once the technologies to collect renewables are that cheap, like information, the wind is free, the sun is free, and it never runs out. Just like information, it doesn't depreciate. So once the technologies get cheaper and cheaper, collecting the sun and the wind and the heat under your ground and your garbage back to energy, it's pretty much free. So pillar two, we're gonna jumpstart an economic revolution in Europe. Pillar one, green energy. Pillar two, we convert the buildings to your own green power plant. Pillar three, tough pillar, storage. The sun isn't always shining. The wind isn't always blowing, or sometimes it's blowing at night, but you want the electricity during the day. Hydroelectricity can be down when the water tables are down from climate change. These are intermittent energies. We've got to store them. I'm in favor of all forms of storage. High, uh, batteries, flywheels, capacitors, water pumping, use them all. But at the center of the storage network, we've committed to hydrogen. It's the basic element of the universe. It's what we're made out of. It carries energy. So when the sun hits your small business or factory or your home, you, you have a solar photovoltaic panels, you generate electricity. If you have some surplus you're not using, you put the electricity in water. The hydrogen comes out in a tank. When there's no sun hitting your roof, you just 
transform it back to electricity. Engineers, a tiny thermodynamic loss right at the end place, very tiny compared to converting fossil fuels and uranium at every step of conversion to get to us. The EU's committed 8 billion euros under Manuel Barroso's presidency of the Commission to moving hydrogen into the infrastructure. Pillar four, this is where the internet converges with the new energies, and this is where you come in. This is where the ICT and the internet technologies converge and become the nervous system to manage distributed energies in these buildings. We use off-the-shelf ICT and internet technology. We transform the power grid of Italy, Europe, and the world to an energy internet in the next 25 years that acts exactly like the internet. So when millions of buildings are collecting that green energy on site, storing it in hydrogen, like we store media in digital, then if you don't need some of that electricity, but someone else in Europe does, your software will program your electricity that's green all the way across Europe from the Irish Sea to the doorsteps of Russia. Germany is testing the energy internet right now in six regions of Germany, and it's amazing. The software connects every appliance in every building. We will know what every washing machine in Europe is doing, every thermostat, every toaster. So let's say that there's, at any given time of day, there's too much demand, not enough supply, prices going up on the grid. We can say to 500,000 washing machines, forget the extra rents. If you bought the program, you get a check or a credit from the utility company. It's voluntary, but now everyone's an energy entrepreneur. Think internet, think ICT. So the appliances are connected. In Germany, they're even connecting ICT and software with weather conditions so that you can know when the sun's radiance is changing in two hours and three hours and adjust it on whether you stay on the grid or go off the grid and whether the wind is changing or how the heat is moving under the ground or how your garbage is decongesting. Amazing. And what we have found is when we put ICT into the homes to monitor with dynamic pricing, digital dials, you'll know what your electricity price is moment to moment because it goes up and down all day. And then you'll be able to program your software remotely or right on site or in your car so that you can buy and sell whenever you want. Go off grid, go on grid, sell your electricity, take it back from the grid. Pillar five, electric plug-in vehicles, hydrogen fuel cell transport. Electric vehicles out this year. Fuel cell vehicles 2014. We just introduced them. I did it jointly with the chairman of uh, Daimler um, at the night before the Frankfurt Auto Show. Daimler invented the, se the second industrial revolution. It created the internal combustion engine. And then Germany created the Autobahn. Good idea, bad government at the time, but good idea, the Autobahn. And we introduced at the Frankfurt Auto Fair, and Mr. Zessix, and I did the narration, the hydrogen fuel cell vehicle. It's out in mass production. Daimler's leading again with General Motors. This vehicle gets 750 kilometers without a fill-up. And the fill-up is green hydrogen, and the exhaust is water and heat, and you can drink the water out of the exhaust if you're thirsty. I wouldn't recommend it. But. So we're going to be able to plug in our cars, buses, and trucks to a green infrastructure, and you get the electricity or the fuel for the hydrogen right from your buildings, and then wherever you travel, you can plug back to the grid on any street. There'll be hundreds of thousands of power charges. It's already all over Europe. The charges are starting. You'll be able to plug in, get green electricity, or let's say you're at work and your car's sitting out there doing nothing. You can program the software so when it's connected to the grid, if the price of electricity reaches a certain point, your software will simply direct your car to get on and sell the electricity back, and at the end of the day, you've made some money. These five pillars together are the new technology. This is what I want to say to you folks in ICT. That individually, they're just components. The technology is the synergies that connect the five pillars in a seamless infrastructure. If one pillar gets ahead of the other pillar or they stand alone, the whole money is lost. We learned this in the EU last year. The European Commission issued a document saying, uh-oh, got a problem. We need a trillion euros for the energy internet right now, in the next nine years. Why? 
We put in feed-in tariffs across Europe, which means your electricity price goes up slightly in your country, like here in Italy. But then it allows you to take that money and convert your building to a power plant and get extra money for sending your premium energy back to the grid. Well, the feed-in tariffs have been so damn successful that we have hundreds of thousands of places trying to get their green electricity back to a grid. All over Germany they're trying to do this. But the grid is 60 years old. It's servo-mechanical. It's one direction. It hasn't even been digitalized. It's disgraceful. And it's like an old person. It leaks 20% of the electricity before it ever gets to you. So we need to get the energy internet in place and bring the entire ICT industry into laying down this entire revolution in the next 20 years in Italy and Europe and the world. Then we realized, uh-oh, these feed-in tariffs have been so successful. We've got regions in Europe that are 20, 30, 60, 70 percent green electricity. Aragon and Navarra, Spain are 60, 70 percent green electricity. We're losing three out of four kilowatts because the wind's blowing at night, we need it during the day, we have sun surges, then lulls, it's screwing up the whole grid. We have to put in hydrogen and other storage so we can have a reliable supply of green electricity so that we can run the grid in a manageable way. Then we realized, uh-oh, pillar two of the buildings. Well, we didn't incentivize the homeowner and the small business, so the big companies in my group, we love this because we can go out and big solar and wind parks and get the premium, but what about the homeowner, the local business? How do they afford 30,000 euros for a photovoltaic power plant? Now we're starting to deal with that in Germany and now in Italy. Here in Italy, you can, we now have some companies that have put the national banks together. There's always money. And they say, oh, there's no money. There's money if there's something to invest in, if there's something to invest in. The banks now come together with startup companies. You want a 30,000 euro photovoltaic on your roof, sign the loan. Within two months to five months, five months is too long, you've got it on your home or your business. Now, the reason that banks are willing to do this, they look at your electricity bill. And they see exactly how much you're going to save in electricity and they know you're going to pay back. They'll give you a, a very low rate of interest. This ain't rocket science. This is money, investment. Then we realized if the other four pillars aren't in place, how do we plug in the Daimler vehicles in GM and Toyota? They're going to be orphaned. So the whole thing comes together. Now, this uh, in, with the ICT group here, the music companies, they didn't understand the distributed collaborative nature of lateral power. When millions of kids started file sharing music and finding software, apparently the kids had nothing else to do after school, <laughs> but find new software to trick into getting all this music shared. The music companies thought it was a joke. Then they went out of business. The newspapers did not understand the distributed collaborative nature of the blogosphere. Millions of people sharing their knowledge, information, and news. Now the newspapers are going out of business or creating blogs. What I want to suggest to you is that what Steve Jobs and that generation did, and HP and IBM and eight, all these companies, that was only the first half of the book. What they did is they allowed us to democratize information, reduce the transaction cost, and move to a lateral world. The second part of the book, the second story, is when you take that democratized technology that ICT provides us and you join it to energy and everybody creates their own energy and shares it collaboratively over grass, physiological, geographic spaces. That's a revolution. That's power to the people. That's the democratization of energy. That's lateral power. That changes the business model, the educational model, the school models, the government. I won't go into this this morning. The new book, ah, oh, you got a copy. Yeah. How is it, you like it? No problem. This is more detail in the book. The Italian translation is pretty darn good, too. So, <laughs> what I'm going to suggest here to you is this the first industrial revolution and second industrial revolution, because the energies were elite and they cost so much financial capital, you had to scale the entire society vertically. That is, large banks to finance it. And then you had to centralize all your production, like these old fiat plants, in centralized factories. 
And then you had to have centralized transport and logistics because the energy was elite and had to be top down and scale. You with me? The third industrial revolution scales laterally. It favors millions of, of small players and thousands of SMEs pooling their risk and scaling their opportunities. Think 3D manufacturing. Yeah? 3D manufacturing. Think all the service industries and social entrepreneurial enterprises. So the first industrial revolution and second favored national markets and the creation of national governments to regulate national markets because the pyramid only went to a certain temporal spatial place. You couldn't do it much more. You couldn't actually globalize the world based on these energies that we've had in the past because they're so centralized you can't flatten them out to the entire planet. So we ended up at the end of the second industrial revolution with 25% of the human race never had electricity. They don't have it this morning. And another 25% of the human race this morning only has marginal access. That's the best we could do. But the third industrial revolution likes to run. It likes to run uninhibited, node to node to node across continental land masses till it reaches the ocean. Just like information likes to run free across the internet. So the way it's going to come in, we have a group of 120 companies in my group, IBM, Cisco, Philips, large architectural firms. We've done some master plans already. We did Rome for the mayor. It's a beautiful plan. You can see it. It's open sourced, everything. Do it yourself. You don't need us. And we did San Antonio, Texas, our seventh largest city. We just finished Utrecht in the Netherlands, Monaco. And what we realize is when the way this is going to come in with ICT and energy, each region and city creates its own node. It works with local business, <coughs> local government, and local civil society, and it begins to transform its infrastructure into this five-pillar node, <coughs> excuse me, and creates jobs day one. That's what happened in Germany. Day one, lots of jobs, lots of businesses. But when a node starts to establish itself, it wants to immediately connect to another node, like Wi-Fi. Because if for example, this region of Torino corrects a no, does a node, it wants to share its surpluses, but it needs another node. Or if it has a lull in its green energy, a lull, it wants someone else in another node to give it green electricity. So it's going to organize node to node to node like Wi-Fi till it reaches across a continent. The third industrial revolution favors not national markets, but continental markets. And it favors continental political unions that are networked, not hierarchy, to regulate it. So here we are this morning. The Prime Minister Monti is taking over. And everybody is saying, fresh air, what do we do? And in Italy, like every other country, the talk is austerity. Austerity, yes, but based on four principles. One, do not compromise the social market model in Italy. Two. Make sure no Italian is left behind. Three, make sure the European dream of quality of life is not undermined. Four, ensure a sustainable society, then make the cuts. There's going to be cuts, but here's what I'm saying to you. And I met with your political leaders here in the last few weeks. If it's only austerity, we're doomed. Because the financial markets will say to Italy and every other country, we want to see cuts. We don't trust your credit line. You've got too much government debt to GDP. And then as soon as you make the cuts, the financial markets say, aha, you have no plan to grow. So we still won't trust your credit lines. We need austerity in Italy and Europe, but it has to be balanced with a new economic plan to move the economy. You can put in all the damn regulations you want for the market, but if you don't have a new engine and a new economy, you're regulating nothing. So what has to happen now is there has to be a growth plan, and let me suggest what it is. The European Union has a golden goose, and Italy is particularly positioned to feed the goose and feed Italy. The golden goose, 500 million consumers across 27 member states. And in your partnership regions in the Mediterranean, North Africa, you have another 500 million consumers. That's a billion person market by far, potentially the most wealthy market in the world. The golden goose is integration of Europe. What we need now 
is to move this third industrial revolution nodal infrastructure across every community of Europe and we embed all of us in a network, just like with the energy, energy like information and energy internet. So we share our energy. Then we need to put in a seamless green electricity energy internet, a seamless communication and transport network so that one billion people can engage in commerce and trade in a post-carbon sustainable society and get the jobs and businesses moving and the multiplier effect for the entire century. That's the next step of European integration. Let me end with Italy here. Frustrating. That's the word I have. I spent 25 years here and here's what I know about Italy. First of all, if I were born again, I'd love to be an Italian. <laughs> My wife too. It's a great culture, but here's what's interesting about Italy. It has some assets to allow it to move side by side with Germany and lead this revolution in Europe. And I know you think, oh, that can't be. Yes, it can. Here's your assets. One, you are the Saudi Arabia of green energy in Europe. Nobody comes close to you. You are a peninsula. You have enough wind off those coastlines till kingdom comes. You have enough solar radiance here to provide forever. You've got geothermal heat in Tuscany. You've got hydro from the Alps. You've got forestry in the northern regions. You've got everything you need here. Number two asset, you have the strongest composition of small and medium-sized enterprises and networks in the world. More powerful than the UK, more powerful than France, right up there with Germany. One-on-one, -on -one, no one can outcompete the small and medium-sized producer cooperatives and business networks in this country. Number two. Number three, you are a federation of regions like Germany. It's not centralized and top-down. So each region can begin to create a node and then cooperate with the other regions until you have a seamless infrastructure within Italy. So what the new prime minister needs to do is tell the story. This is a great narrative. We are heading toward a smart world based on bringing ICT together with distributed energy and democratizing the economy and creating distributed capitalism. And the ICT in this room can make this happen. You're the nervous system. If this isn't the plan, these five pillars, what is the plan? Is there another plan? Go back to the 20th century? So what I think we need to ask in this moment of fresh air in Italy, where do you want to be in 20 years? The sunset energies, technologies, and infrastructure of a dying second industrial revolution? Or the sunrise energies, technologies, and infrastructure of an emerging third industrial revolution? Last, last thought. Even though this game plan is common sense, as my wife said, gee, it took you folks 20 years to figure that one out. We got to go to renewable energies, and then you got to collect them, that's the buildings, because they're all over the place. Then you got to store them, they're intermittent, that's hydrogen and other storage. Then you got to put it in energy internet to share them, because you have to collaborate, and then you have to plug them into transport. She said, that took you 20 years? Yeah. So I don't know why it took us all so long, but even with a good economic plan, and technology to make it happen, I'm going to say to you, this is not going to happen without a shift in consciousness to go with it. We have got to move from geopolitics to biosphere consciousness in one generation. And I think the new technologies allow us to begin to do that because up until the modern age, we were foragers, hunters, and agriculturalists. So every day of our life, try to imagine this, we were totally in tuned with the weather conditions, with the rhythms of the earth, with the solar radiance and the wind. Because every day we were connected to the rhythms that allowed us to sustain our life as foragers, hunters, and agriculturalists. When we went to the first industrial revolution, we got off track. We saw this chunk of stored sunlight from a previous period of history, coal, oil, gas, uranium. We captured it and thought, we don't need nature. Hermetically seal ourselves off and we'll live in utopia forever. It was an illusion. And now the nightmare is climate change. But when we go back to the rhythms of nature, a third industrial revolution, think about it, in your small business, your large company, your residential neighborhood, 
Every day you become and I become aware of the rhythms of nature. How is the sun doing today? When is the wind velocity going to be picking up? How's my garbage reconverting overnight in my basement? What's going on with the heat under the earth because of the seasonal shift from the summer to the fall? Every living organism, from little microbes to humans, is made up of myriad biological clocks. And it, all these clocks are entrained to lunar, solar, and circanial rhythms. Jet lag, you know when you get jet lag. So now we reestablish our biological and physiological and economic rhythms and entrainment back to the Earth's dynamics. This is biosphere consciousness, and here's what I'll leave you with. The kids are there. I mean, I, I'm not an optimist, as some of you know. I never have been. I've been doing this too long. And I'm not a pessimist. I'm only guardedly hopeful we can do this because of what I've seen in the schools. This has happened in less than five years. Kids are coming home, 10-year-old kids, your kids, and they're saying to mom and dad, why is the TV mode on in that room? We're not using that TV. Why do we have such a big car in an urban area? We don't need it. Where did my clothes, where were they grown? And what, where did this hamburger come from on my table? This isn't a good example. Beef. Where did that piece of beef come from on my dinner plate? Did it come from a rainforest in Central America? Did they have to destroy the trees to graze the cattle on the soil? And when they destroyed the trees, what happened to all the animal species that relies on those trees for canopy? Did they go extinct? And when they destroyed the trees, that meant industrial-induced CO2 had no sink because the trees absorbed the CO2. That means the temperature of the Earth goes up. And if the temperature of the Earth goes up, that means that some farmer 10,000 miles away is getting more floods and droughts and can't raise food for his kids. That's biosphere consciousness. They're learning that everything we do has an ecological footprint all day long that affects the well-being of some other family or some other creature. Does this sound right? That's systemic thinking. That's connecting the dots that were all embedded in the rhythms of this planet. So here's the mission. We got the ICT here in Italy in this room. I was just in Milan saying this yesterday. Create a biosphere valley. The first, the second industrial revolution, the great universities, the academic institutions in the California and the West Coast, they joined with startup companies and large companies and Silicon Valley became a laboratory for democratizing information. I think those days are passing. And what I would suggest to you is the next stage is a biosphere valley from Milan to Torino. Because you have all the ICT companies, but you also have ecological sensibilities. And you want to push for a sustainable world. And so create a biosphere valley in this region from Milan to Torino. Bring all their companies together, small, medium, and large, across the five pillars. With ICT right at the center of this network and renewable energy, create a biosphere valley with the universities, the research institutions, and the companies, and start integrating new ideas. Start creating the synergies between the five pillars. Start moving the Italy and the world into a new economic paradigm. The legacy will be clear. We democratize energy like we democratize information. We create a post-carbon world. We drop the temperature on the planet. We restore our relationship with our fellow creatures. We make this world livable again. We pass on hope for those generations not yet here. In this room, you have the expertise to create that nervous system. Now we need to be up to the task on mission and focused during this breath of fresh air in Italy. Because I have no doubt, if you channel this attention, Italy can move with Germany and together create this vision for Europe and the world. We're counting on you.